Good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our Northern Light Health Good Health is Good Business Zoom conference. Today, we are having an important conversation about embracing a culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm Karen Hawks, Vice President of Operations at Northern Light Beacon Health, and I will be your moderator for the next hour. Now more than ever, the discourse across the country is causing us to reflect on our own behaviors, our own assumptions, and our beliefs. As we reflect throughout today's discussion, we invite you to also consider what role or responsibilities employers have in creating a culture of caring for our employees and the communities that we serve. Some of us have already begun to actively work toward a culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Others may be wondering where and how to get started. And many are fearful of making a mistake. Today's discussion is intended to help you start the conversation, to highlight the value of a diverse workforce and community collaboration, and to provide you with strategies for getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. In addition, I am pleased to welcome back Dr. Jim Jarvis to relate to COVID-19. Our panelists today are Marwa Hasnan, the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Northern Light Health, Yamaya St. Clair, a licensed clinical professional counselor, counselor for Northern Light Work Health, Workforce, excuse me. Melissa Scahan, the Vice President of Mission Integration at Northern Light Mercy Hospital. And Dr. Jim Jarvis, the Senior Physician Executive and Director of Clinical Education at Northern Light Eastern Maine Medical Center. Dr. Jarvis also serves as the COVID-19 Response Incident Commander. Before we get started, I will read our legal disclosure. The coronavirus pandemic is an ongoing, continuously evolving situation. Northern Light Health encourages everyone to follow federal and state governmental guidance and mandates. Northern Light Health does not know the particulars of your situation, so the information presented today is general in nature and is based upon Northern, Lights Health, Northern Light Health's own experience, which may or may not apply in your specific situation, and which may re be revised as we learn more about the coronavirus. Accordingly, following any guidance Northern Light Health presents today in no way guarantees that you or your employees and or your customers and clients will not contract or spread the coronavirus. A reminder, this hour is for you. If at any time you have a question for one of our panelists, please use the chat function. I'll keep track of your questions and we'll have the speakers respond. Also, I hope each of you will take a few minutes immediately following our hour to answer our quick five question survey. Your input helps us select and plan for future Zoom conference topics. So let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce Marwa Hassanen for, for, uh, of Northern Light Health, who will set the foundation for today's discussion and share strategies for getting started. Marwa. Thank you so much, Karen. And good morning, everyone. As Karen mentioned, my name is Marwa Hassanen, and I am the System Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Northern Light. It is my honor and pleasure to be here with you all this morning. And I'd like to kick this off by discussing a little bit about why DEI work is so important. As we all know, Maine is a highly homogenous state. It is not racially or ethnically diverse, with 96% of the population being white. So we really need to elevate these issues in order to make our state more inclusive and equitable. Research suggests that celebrating diversity and creating organizational principles that are culturally literate and that openly respect individuals' various and intersectional racial, ethnic, sexual and gender differences is far more beneficial than just taking a blind, a colorblind approach in which one ignores identity-based differences. So over the past several years, we've seen this steady increase in individuals beginning the process of education and self-reflection to become awakened to the struggles that those in marginalized groups face on a daily basis. So while this is a great start, more needs to be done to bring forth systemic change and bring the whole workforce into alignment with ideal cultural norms. We must build empathy and help people have the courage to do the internal work required to create lasting change. This work is often difficult and awkward and conversations can be very uncomfortable and that's okay. So even someone like myself who comes from a very diverse background and I'm certified in doing this work, I have a lot of awkward moments, but we need to get to the point where we are comfortable with being uncomfortable. This concept of cultural humility is essential in, in order to build greater trust 
amongst colleagues within organizations and to really sustain a culture of belonging and respect for all. So at Northern Light Health, we have indeed taken actionable steps in order to walk the walk. Northern Light Health is taking an active role in creating this change and supporting a culture of care and trust at all levels of our organization. Some of these efforts um, are, are widespread and we have embarked on a full-scale organizational effort around medical equity, racial and social justice led by our wonderful CEO, Tim Dentry, who has truly been a champion of this work. Some of these examples include myself providing foundational DEI training and education for over 12,000 of our employees with a goal to cultivate a sense of safe community, foster diversity and growth, and create a welcoming and affirming environment for providers and patients alike. Uh, there's a DEI council that was created this year and Tim Dentry chairs it that was tasked with reviewing policies and practices to identify ways in which Northern Light Health can support DEI and create uh, trust. Tim also hosts the Tim Talk podcast, which seeks to break down barriers, open hearts and minds to diversity, and focus on issues of social and medical justice. We've had over 20 guests this year who have shared their stories, their backgrounds, their expertise with Tim on these important topics. And these, these podcasts have been phenomenal. They've been heard all over the country. And recently we had a system-wide diversity and inclusion survey that brought forth responses from over 2000 of our employees across Northern Light Health. And we use these results in national benchmarks to really gauge and measure the actionable steps we're taking. So while, um, excuse me, sorry. Um, so you might ask yourself, how do I get started? And where does my organization start on this DI journey? Well, I have to say that I, you know, there are great things um, Great things take years to build, and this really is a marathon and not a sprint. Uh, different organizations are in different points on the DEI continuum, and to help you assess where your organization is at and on on this DEI journey, um, here are some helpful helps and, and hints to help you identify potential areas for work. So to be effective allies, leaders, mentors, and colleagues, we must first educate ourselves and examine our own internal biases and understand how privilege and system level inequities create barriers to different groups. Create a mission statement for your organization and become torchbearers and ambassadors of that mission to make sure everyone is seen, heard, and empowered. Make diversity trainings in education, all these programs are essential in, in order to create shared understanding of the barriers and challenges and microaggressions that are experienced by others. Um, this is a great way to really build allyship and strong allies within the workforce. Make a commitment that all employees understand their role in supporting inclusion and diversity and feel that they have the skills, the knowledge, and the resources necessary to take action. And finally, it's important to reach out and collaborate, expand your networks, and explore a diversity of perspectives, and reach out to those diverse stakeholders and pull them in. Some resources across our state include the Maine Multicultural Center, Maine Health Equity Alliance, Equality Maine, the Literacy Volunteers of Bangor, Racial Equity and Justice, WIN, which is Welcoming Your Immigrant Neighbor, PICA, Power um, and Community Alliances, Merck. Those are just a few examples. There are many, many more. And thank you. Thank you so much, Marla. Our next panelist is Yamaya Sinclair from Northern Light Workforce. Yamaya will speak to the value of a diverse workforce as well as some of the mental health risk employers should be mindful of. Yamaya, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me into this really important conversation. And I wanted to start by just acknowledging how 
overwhelming and emotionally charged it can be to talk about racism and equity, we've all been deeply conditioned to think and behave in certain ways. And it's, it's hard to look deeply at that conditioning and question it. If you're on this call, you've already begun that process. And I recognize some of you have probably been deeply immersed in these conversations for a long time by choice or necessity, uh, while others are just getting started. Particularly for those of you relatively new to these conversations, I really encourage you to be patient with yourself and with the learning process. Often I hear from leaders who have become much more aware of the need to level the playing field and commit to inclusion and equity. And they're really anxious to take action, to, to, to do something. Um, and while that's necessary, for sure, any rushed or premature actions can actually be more harmful than helpful. So before action, we really recommend that leadership teams kind of slow their role and, and take these initial steps of building awareness, right? Acknowledging where and how do we need to go beyond the surface to, to get at the deeper truths. Um, and acknowledgement, you know, what truths are we proud of? What challenges must we candidly acknowledge? And then looking for that aspiration. What do we aspire to be? Do we have the courage and conviction to really make that happen? When leaders become more aware of the concerns of employees, particularly underrepresented employees, and acknowledge, really candidly acknowledge how leaders may have contributed to or even caused some of these challenges, that's where the potential for real change occurs. And this is slow, hard work. It's also really important work for a few different reasons. Uh, first, it's good business to be a diverse employer, to have people around you who look and act differently and have different ideas. It's proven that companies that have more diverse leadership and a more integrated and hol holistic view of society actually perform better. Second, today's consumers are increasingly paying attention to give their business and hard earned dollars to companies that reflect the values they share for themselves. And lastly, there's of course the ethical imperative. Businesses are positioned to be leaders in our society more now than at any other time in our history. As employers strive to advance DEI work, there's several important actions they can take. The first is to really make this personal. The leaders who most effectively lead their organizations on this journey can only do it because they're committed to their own personal journey. If leaders can't identify how they have become more aware about others who are different from them or acknowledge where they have messed up or can't articulate their own personal aspiration of how they wanna become more equitable and inclusive, the broader organization isn't really set up to succeed. And part of an organization's success in this work is focusing on the intersection of inclusion and mental health. So we know, um, next slide please, that recent acts of racism and violence and the health disparities of COVID-19, they're really taking a toll on mental health. One study finds that anxiety and depression symptoms have more than tripled in Black, Indigenous, Asian, and Latino communities this year, spiking after the death of George Floyd. The health disparities of COVID-19 are also responsible as Black and Latino Americans are three times as likely to become infected with COVID-19 as white Americans and nearly twice as likely to die from the virus. This all points to this reality that mental health and diversity inclusion are really closely connected. Employees from diverse backgrounds, as Marwin noted, can face lack of representation, microaggressions, unconscious bias, and other stressors that impact their mental health and psychological safety at work. As a result, initiatives that support diversity and inclusion can also support mental health and, and vice versa. As employers deepen their focus on diversity, inclusion, racial justice, they should ensure that employees from diverse backgrounds have the mental health support they need from employee resource groups, to counseling services, to mental health screening tools. This can be an essential element of effective DEI strategy and investment. And then we really wanna you know, educate and empower managers, familiarize our workforce with the resources that they have. And training, educating, and empowering managers to lead on both mental health and inclusion and how the two intersect that can really speed needed support to employees from diverse backgrounds. 
managers may be in the best position to handle sensitive issues with individual employees, can help answer questions, address concerns, and direct people to the best available resources. One way to encourage buy-in among staff around all of this is to initiate a conversation around organizational values and workplace culture. Uh, as Marwa mentioned, you know, creating a, a mission statement around this is an excellent idea. Diversity and inclusion work includes embracing all employees' authentic selves. You know, when our, when our colleagues don't feel safe or they fear retribution or don't feel heard or valued, they can't really bring their whole and authentic selves to work and, and can't give the best of themselves. So having these big picture conversations about everyone feeling safe and included and valued is one way to really lay a foundation for the challenging work of focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And to do more than lip service, to, to truly be vulnerable to learning and growth, we just wanna reiterate that this is hard work and necessary work. So encourage people to really approach it really thoughtfully and wholeheartedly seeking out resources to help along the way. And the, the racial equity tools shown here offer a really great place to start. Thanks. Thank you so much, Umaya. That was, that was very powerful and, and wonderful information. I appreciate that. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Melissa Scahan, who is joining us from Northern Light Mercy Hospital. As some of you may know, community and compassion is truly at the core of Mercy Hospital's mission. It is a pleasure to have Melissa here to, to share um, Mercy's experience, share her lessons learned through the pandemic, and how these lessons will impact their future work with the community they serve. So welcome, Melissa. Thank you so much, Karen. So when I think about the work of Mercy, uh, truly, we have a long history of working with diverse communities. Um, we are Portland's uh, community hospital and have been for 101 years. Um, you know, each year we have annual events uh, with uh, multiple diverse communities. We have uh, contractual relationships with community health outreach workers, interpreter services, and other services that provide direct service to multiple communities within Greater Portland. Um, we created a cultural resource guide that was a wonderful body of work with interns from Bowdoin College, large focus groups with the top 12 communities in Greater Portland. Um, and we learned a lot through that work. Uh, you know, we learned, uh, we really identified decision-making practices, health healthcare norms, cultural norms, and other preferences so that we felt well prepared to serve uh, patients that came to us. Um, when, uh, we came, when it came time for COVID, uh, when there was uh, activity in Greater Portland, outbreaks in pl at play, we were called upon by both the state and the city to respond fully. And with our long history of working directly with diverse communities, uh, I felt that we were well prepared to do this body of work. Um, so when I reflect on what that looked like, very often we would present in neighborhoods. We would have partner organizations uh, by our side. So we would have interpreters, we would have uh, community health outreach workers, uh, and uh, we would set up uh, pop-up clinics uh, to provide that universal testing. And what was um, somewhat startling to me uh, was that we were really having moderate success in engaging people. Um, and when it was an opportunity for uh, Northern Light Mercy to open a mass vaccination clinic in Greater Portland, I knew that we had to pause and really reconsider everything we were doing through the ends of through the lens of equity. Um, so it's great. It's really a great story as it relates to this, uh, to this uh, presentation. So next slide, please. So when I think about equity, it's really acknowledging that not everybody starts at the same place. And it's making that critical commitment to co-create a path forward with, uh, with a partner, uh, with lived experience so that we can ensure that every person has full access uh, to what you're seeking to deliver. In this case, it truly was vaccine. Um, so next slide, please. So we had to acknowledge that our tried and true method uh, was not gonna give us high rates of, uh, 
of participation or potentially would not. So we truly had to reach out uh, to our partner organizations. Uh, I called uh, Maine Immigrant Rights Coalition, Merck. Uh, Merck is made up of 69 organizations and asked for help, asked that they identify both formal and informal leaders so that we could co-create what the clinic at the exposition building in Portland looked like. I wanted to make sure that there were um, multilingual signs and that there was a uh, different an enrollment process that was alternative uh, so that we could ensure that people uh, had ease of access. Uh, we quickly learned in doing this work uh, that we needed cultural brokers to attend the clinics um, and that we needed to ensure that people could schedule appointments in groups. Uh, it truly gave comfort to many of the patients we had opportunity to speak with uh, to describe uh, what it felt like to be at a clinic uh, with uh, people who looked like them, who spoke the same language as they did. Um, and it allowed us to just deliver uh, exceptional, uh, to, to deliver an exceptional uh, experience in the moment. Uh, as I think we all know, many people have isolated for the last year. Uh, so even truly coming out into a site like this um, can be unsettling for some. Uh, the ability to really embrace and surround and act as a follower or co-creator versus uh, a healthcare provider was really a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Um, so uh, as part of this too, I think a critical uh, learning for us that was that we needed to consistently solicit feedback and really set a stage for continuous learning. Um, and that uh, what that looks like is multiple organizations, multiple both formal and informal leaders <clears throat> with continuous conversations throughout the week. Um, we have supported much work as it relates to vaccine uh, confidence, uh, everything from uh, creating individual videos for distinct communities, um, as well as uh, other uh, materials to help with that promotion. And I'm happy to share one of the videos with you. Hello, my name is Shambhopa Him, President of Unified Asian Communities. We here at UAC believes that everyone deserves to live in a community that fosters a sense of belonging, value compassion, and support their neighbors. UAC strongly encourages everyone to serve their community by getting vaccinated. Community leaders in UAC are here to stay and here to help. Thank you. Hola amigos, muchos saludos, cuídense mucho. Los invito a poner el hombro, como dicen en mi país, para vacunarse por ustedes, por su familia, por nuestra comunidad. No tengan miedo, la vacuna es segura y es más seguro estar vacunado que enfermarse. Cuídense mucho. And Lainey, we can, stop, we can stop can there. This it. will um, go through multiple communities. Um, so just a sense of, of the work that we did within these uh, distinct communities. Uh, multilingual communications also very important. So all of our signage, um, we co-created, placement was really determined by our partners. Uh, and many of the universal messages that we made uh, not, along with the signs for welcome and thank you um, were uh, co-created and really designed by partners. You can go to the next slide. And this is the, uh, this is actually my final slide. So I would, you know, if I reflect on the whole, it was truly uh, embracing an opportunity to walk forward with humility. Even though Mercy truly has been at this work for years, uh, we, we were in a position where we had to acknowledge uh, that we needed help and that we really needed to ensure, uh, we needed to acknowledge that uh, without that help, we would not be able to get high rates of uh, participation. Uh, every clinic, we have a large number of 
non-native English speakers uh, that attend in groups. And it's been pretty, pretty amazing to watch. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. I'd now like to welcome back Dr. Jim Jarvis and invite him to provide you with the latest information as it relates to COVID-19. Dr. Jarvis. Thank you, Karen. Uh, what a great, great, great presentation today. And, and I echo the sentiments, particularly those of Melissa, about what our vaccine clinics have been like. Uh, while Bangor is not as diverse as the Portland market, uh, we certainly are seeing an increase in diversity. And I can say that is definitely firsthand uh, here while I'm at the Cross Center, Cross Insurance Center right now. Um, it, has been, it has been fabulous to see uh, everybody stepping up and getting vaccinated. And uh, Maine has crossed a milestone. 50% of all Mainers over the age of 16 have at least have received at least one dose of vaccine. And basically that leads the nation in percent population who have been vaccinated. About a full third of Mainers now are fully, can be considered fully vaccinated against the uh, disease that, uh, the virus that causes COVID-19. And that is fabulous. But unfortunately, we are seeing that that uh, we're seeing hesitancy now um, in, in larger numbers, uh, very similar to what states who had led before um, had seen, uh, but they didn't reach that that 50% threshold that we had hit. Um, and so Maine continues to be a leader, but we still have a long way to go. So next slide, please. So really what we need to start towing is encouraging people to get vaccinated. And those videos that you just saw are wonderful because they, out, they have outreach to particular community um, aspects and we need to continue to, to encourage that. What I ask you as employers and leaders in, in your communities to think about is how you help your, your staff and, and uh, members of your community to get vaccinated. Can you provide them the time off so that they can go to a vaccine clinic? Can you encourage them in other ways? Can you share your own personal stories if that's um, uh, something that you feel comfortable doing? Uh, we know that we need to get at least 80% of all adults in the state of Maine vaccinated before we can consider ourselves having community immunity or what people have called herd immunity in the past. But really it is that, that sense of community and it is what we need to do. If we think about it, that the, the spread of virus really has to do with how much virus is actually in our community at any given time. Uh, the more viral elements that are out there, the more people who can be infected and the more serious their illnesses can be. We see that the numbers in the state of Maine are unfortunately increasing even as we've had the most successful vaccination program in the country. Um, and that's because of the age population that we're seeing who are now uh, leading the way in, in individuals who are becoming sick with COVID-19. Uh, that age net group is now lower, is now becoming more and more people under the age of 50 instead of those over the age of 50. It's encouraging that uh, individuals over the age of 50 and particularly 60 and 70 um, have, uh, have uh, lessened in the number of, of cases that we've seen because many of them live in long-term care facilities where we have not only vaccinated the residents but also the staff. And we really are not seeing any outbreaks in those communities anymore due to vaccination efforts. So we know vaccines work. We know that they can work even better when more of us get vaccinated. And as we right now cannot vaccinate children, we need more adults to get vaccinated. There are plenty of slots across the state and those, these two uh, websites uh, that are listed here can help. Uh, the first one is the Maine CDC's website, which lists every um, clinic that the state of Maine supports, um, including those at Northern Light Health. And if you want to visit a Northern Light Health clinic, uh, that's the, the website for there. Next slide, please. So what's the next big thing? Uh, the biggest thing right now that we're dealing with is the pause that got put on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, often called the one and done vaccine, as it only required a single dose uh, for those to be considered fully, fully vaccinated. Um, however, it has some issues with it, uh, particularly um, around the possibility that it may be uh, associated with blood clots in uh, what we call cerebral sinuses. So in our brain, we have normal blood vessels like arteries and veins, but we also have these cavities, um, and these are not the same cavities that uh, we, we talk about when we talk about sinus infections. They're very different sinuses than that, uh, where blood actually pools. And um, there has been an association with six uh, women all under the age of 40 um, who had recently had the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, who then came down um, with this particularly rare condition. That six sounds like a lot, except that six million people had already received the vaccine. And in the general population, uh, this occurs almost amount of time of five people with six, out of six million uh, get this condition. So it's hard to really say that the statistics point to the vaccine as actually being the cause, but we are warning people that if they had a severe headache, backache, um, unusual uh, neurologic symptoms, uh, abdominal pain, uh, or legs, 
uh, leg swelling or leg pain or shortness of breath that they, they should visit their primary care um, or seek emergency care if it's severe illness um, after they've had that Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, that pause then uh, caused us some issues. That was the vaccine that we'd planned on using in our doctor's offices. It was the vaccine that we were hopeful to use uh, and people who are homebound. Um, and so this pause is, is definitely um, adding to the hesitancy uh, and our vaccination efforts. We'll know more tomorrow after the advisory committee on immunization practices of the CDC um, meets and looks at the data a little bit more closely. Um, my own personal opinion is that they will probably come back with a recommendation to continue to use Johnson & Johnson, but may put some restrictions on it for particular age categories um, or individuals taking certain medications. And so more to come on that. Uh, but the other big exciting news is that the Pfizer vaccine, which is the one that we have been using uh, predominantly in our state since the beginning of the vaccine um, rollout in December, uh, remember that's the one that requires that ultra cold freezer, so is the one that we're using specifically at some of our large scale vaccination sites, uh, that they have data to suggest that uh, not only is the vaccine safe, but it is also effective in individuals who are uh, age 12 and older. And that, that would be a game changer for us because instead of us just talking about needing to vaccinate uh, 80 to 90 percent of adults in Maine, we could start uh, uh, talking about vaccinating uh, some younger people as well. Um, all of the vaccines that are currently uh, have emergency use authorization in the United States, so that would be Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson, are all conducting studies on being able to vaccinate even younger ages, including some studies uh, looking at being able to vaccinate infants. Uh, but if uh, emergency use authorization is extended for Pfizer for 12 and above, then we can start protecting more of our kids uh, who are at school age, um, and therefore we can hopefully have a, a return to normal school activity come the fall. I think that's it, and we'll be uh, going on to questions now. Thank you so much, Dr. Jarvis. So as he mentioned, it's now time to answer your questions. And I invite you again to ask your questions using the chat feature. Um, I will organize as best I can, and hopefully we can get to all your questions. But I am really looking forward to this, this discussion. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be um, a very very interesting one. But before we dive into some of our questions related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, I wanted to follow up with you, Dr. Jarvis, um, regarding the uh, 12 and uh, 12 and well, going down to age 12. Do you have any um, idea as to the anticipated timeline as to when that might be released? Yeah, well, we had expected that Pfizer would have asked for an extension of their emergency use authorization or an addendum to their emergency use authorization uh, sometime last week or this week. My own speculation is that because of the issue with Johnson & Johnson and the fact that the ACIP is, is tied up with, with investigating that particular aspect, that there's been a pause put on, uh, on that, that ask. Uh, I do expect, though, that, that when that ask comes, it will probably be turned around pretty quickly. Uh, the data that has been released by um, Pfizer really does point to the fact that this is a safe and effective vaccine for people 12 and older. Um, right now, of course, that's the only one approved for 16 to 18 year olds. Um, and so, uh, so it is the one that we've been dealing using for those that younger group already, um, and just expand beyond that. So I would expect that by the end of May, we'll, we'll be talking about using this vaccine um, for uh, for people 12 and older, which I know the parents of, of, of many of us uh, are very excited about the ability to be able to get uh, more of our family members vaccinated. That question and I see the comment by Bridget in the chat, and I appreciate that. And I have visited most of our clinics and, uh, and I appreciate the community um, outreach and support. And so thank you for passing that along. Perhaps we need to promote your presence at these clinics to get over some vaccine hesitancy. Maybe that would help. Dr. I believe Jarvis. there was a suggestion to have a cardboard cutout that you could take a selfie with me and Dr. Shaw, but thankfully my wife put the kibosh on that one. So. That was, thank goodness for your wife. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Dr. Jarvis, for that additional information. And so Mara, the first question I, I'm, I'm going to throw to you, because you had referenced um, just the shift in at Northern Light Health in recent, over the past year under Tim Dentry's leadership, a real focus on creating a culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and it's a priority for Northern Light Health. And so many of our employees are participating in trainings, as you mentioned, engaging in really important discussions on diversity, and even serving as change agents within their own local departments. Um, but I think like any organization, we, we have to acknowledge that there are some who are questioning why is this a priority right now? And so as employers begin to start these conversations or continue these conversations, what strategies can you share to, for employers to handle that kind of feedback? 
Thank you for that question, Karen. And we have received some pushback and that's normal. We expect that, you know, any organization should expect that, you know, and I think first and foremost, I think leaders um, should be role models. Um, we, in the DEI realm, we call them diversity diehards um, and also collaborators and accomplices and co-conspirators. I love that word. So if there is, you know, champion, championships, I guess, or, or champions of this work at the very, very top for senior uh, leadership, then it trickles down. You know, if there is any kind of hesitancy or um, if we don't have that complete buy-in, then there's lack of credibility and employees read that, you know. So again, that's, you know, first and foremost, we need leaders to create an environment where, the, you know, diversity is embraced and not feared. You know, and I think a lot of the pushback comes from fear. Um, there's fear of, you know, um, being offensive or being, um, you know, hurtful to people. So, so people, you know, hold back and withdraw and don't want to do this work. As Yamaya and I mentioned, you know, it is difficult. It is uncomfortable and awkward at times. But, uh, uh, you know, leaders need to really... Um, reiterate and, and emphasize that, you know, these are, we're taking baby steps across the nation. Um, diversity benefits all of us. You know, these perspectives help us, you know, with our own biases, we all have them, we're only human. Um, and to really e expand our own horizons. And so this, you know, the different comfort levels and engaging the DEI work is normal, but leaders need to continue to, you know, push their employees in, in this direction, in this positive direction, and again, be, become those ambassadors and those torchbearers for this work. Thank you so much. And I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I think that we're a lot of us are concerned that if we make a mistake that that will be define define our character, right? And and impact our personal professional relationships. And Yamai, I wanted to invite you to kind of chime in and follow up on Marwa um, at her, you know, this this theme of fear and how how do employ, employers tackle that? Yeah, thank you. It's a it's a real one to acknowledge and be aware of. Um, and also really building a that, that culture of psychological safety that I mentioned, like we have to be all willing to make mistakes, right? And to, to own them, to acknowledge them at every level within an organization. And so when, our, when leaders are able to do that, when leaders are able to say, you know, this is hard for me, or I did this, you know, I said this thing or did this thing that, um, that I, I'm not proud of. And in retrospect, I, um, I really made a mistake. And, and to, to say I'm sorry and to commit to moving forward um, in a different direction. And I think um, if similarly, if leaders can uh, hear when employees maybe acknowledge a mistake and not react um, by, you know, doing all the things people can do, like belittling them or all the different ways, but just saying thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that and committing to moving forward in another way. I think we have to you know, we're often talking with leaders about, and with, with everyone in an organization about this reality that um, intent doesn't equal impact always. And, um, and, and it, we hear this often in, in these conversations, well, that wasn't my intention, or I didn't mean it that way, right? And, right, and the impact was that something you may have said or done um, didn't land the way you intended, and it's the impact that really matters. And so, building a culture of uh, within an organization where it's, it's okay to acknowledge that the impact was what it was, to apologize and to commit to not doing that again or to doing it in a different way um, is, is really important. And again, just that acknowledgement that we're all human, we're all learning, we can all be vulnerable in this and making like normalizing that is a big part of this journey. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Melissa, I wanted to, to um, follow up with you on this. Um, you know, Mercy Hospital, you serve one of Maine's more diverse regions. Um, and we have employers on this Zoom conference from all areas of the state of Maine. Many of them are more hom homogenous than the Portland area, Portland region. Um, what lessons have you learned do you think are is transferable or, or even why should these employers prioritize diversity inclusion um, when they're not seeing a very diverse community surrounding them? 
Absolutely. Thank you, Karen. You know, when I think about that, and I look at opportunity within Maine, I would say that some of the most um, vital uh, opportunities for growth and new employees really rests with the new Mainer community. Um, you know, we've had opportunity to work closely with some um, some folks who are new to the Maine who have, you know, and they're uh, who have engineering backgrounds, healthcare backgrounds, education backgrounds, uh, and they are looking to build a career. So they're uh, anxious to really join a company uh, that really will allow them uh, opportunities for growth and uh, particip participation. Uh, they're really looking to join community. Um, so when you think about an employer in that fashion, it's a, it's a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful thing to embrace. You know, what it brings to the workplace truly is that notion. Uh, I think Yamaya had referenced it. It's about innovation. It's about diverse thought, you know, bringing people who look different and have different experience and think differently adds a vitalness to employees, employers that may be absent if you have people who all look the same uh, and who uh, have not had uh, world experience. We're also in a global market. Um, so when I think about the opportunity to embrace it, uh, it's almost an imperative because we really are uh, in a global market and we have these incredible people who truly are looking for opportunity. Um, and when you think about Maine, uh, you know, we all need employees. Um, so great opportunity. Melissa, I would just add too, in, in addition to, to new Mainers, I think we're seeing a real trend during uh, this pandemic of people moving away from urban areas and looking mm -hmm. to more rural areas and, um, and looking to Maine. I mean, you can see it in our housing market, right? And so we, um, we, if people from diverse backgrounds in other parts of our country or world are moving to places in Maine or looking at Maine, we wanna make sure that we're prepared to, um, to really make that environment um, welcoming and to make it so that there is you know, more representation. And so those you know, microaggressions that Marwa mentioned are addressed and all of that in order to be a, a attractive employers um, to a, a much wider, uh, you know, population that we have a real potential to expand Maine's workforce here. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was our, our last Zoom conference we really focused on that um, benefit. Uh, one of the benefits of COVID is it is attracting a new workforce to the state of Maine. So thank you, Yamaya, for, for adding that in as well. Um, Dr. Jarvis, I do have a couple of questions for you, um, but before we dive into some of them, um, I would like to ask you to chime in on this concept of inclusion and diversity as it relates to the organizational work, operational work you've been doing around the vaccination clinic planning and what are some of the lessons that you might have learned or considerations that you're now taking in that you might not have prior to um, COVID-19? Yeah, Karen, that's a great question. And so, you know, one of the best examples. Oh, sorry, Dr. Jones. <laughs> I, that was me. Continue. Right. I did. I do. Want I'll to remember that, Karen. <laughs> uh, no, I think one of the best examples really came from from Mercy as we started to build the clinic down the vaccine clinic at the expo. One of the requests that, that came out was uh, making sure that we had an area where we could be a little bit more private in administering vaccinations because for some uh, uh, for some cultures it is important that uh, privacy be maintained uh, when when um, when administering some kind of medical aid. And while we had not seen that up at the at the Cross Insurance Center, our first large scale clinic, um, it was eye opening to us because we didn't we then started to experience it afterwards. And so we made sure that at every one of our sites we did have a, a private area. And that's actually been very good for us, not only from a cultural standpoint, but from a medical standpoint as well. Um, we have had some individuals who have had some mild uh, but, but uh, reactions, but ones that required some medical care, 
um, as well as individuals who have just said, listen, the, you know, the anxiety of being in a place where there's a lot of people when I haven't been around a lot of people or the fear of needles, uh, we've been able to put them in a quiet private place. And so we've actually been able to expand out our care and our reach that really started from, from really understanding local cultural needs um, and, and particularly that one around privacy. So just that alone, but then also just being sensitive, you know, as we talked about, there are many people moving into our state now where English is not their first language and being able to make ensure that we we have uh, either translation services directly on site um, or virtual translation services if need be. Uh, to capture that community is extremely important um, and one that oftentimes even in doctor's offices has been lacking and so we need to make sure that we continue the good work that we've done in outreach to communities that may be a little bit underrepresented um, and certainly those that uh, have been underserved in the past um, we are a global community now and we need to think and, and act like that so thank you for that question Thank you, Dr. Jarvis. So as a follow up, we do have um, a question in the chat box related to the spread of COVID vaccine. And um, can a person who's received the vaccination um, still carry and spread the uh, COVID-19 virus? And is it safe for them to be unmasked while they're around family who may not have been vaccinated? Yes, that's a great question. So we do know that if everybody in a household has been fully vaccinated, that uh, the likelihood of transmission of disease is incredibly small. Um, and so certainly in that household, uh, going without masking uh, is perfectly acceptable behavior. Um, it is possible, though unlikely, that someone who has been fully vaccinated can be infected with the virus, uh, particularly as we see more variants out there, and soon we'll probably have variants that our current vaccines uh, uh, will not protect us against. Uh, the issue there is that you might not be sick, and so you don't even realize that you're that you have the that you've been infected. Um, but once you've been infected, obviously you can become contagious, and there you can spread the disease. So we need to be very careful and cautious about that. It's why we continue to tell people who are fully vaccinated to wear uh, masks while they're out in public and still maintain uh, six feet of social distancing, as well as we should all be washing our hands frequently or using hand sanitizer regularly, regardless of whether we're in a pandemic or not. So that will continue. For this particular individual case, you really have to talk about risk. What is the risk to, to your mom? Uh, you know, is she have other high risk conditions just besides age? Um, and consider that when, when, uh, when in, um, in uh, contacting uh, them uh, and then find out the reasons why, uh, you know, they themselves have not been vaccinated and if it's really a, a case of they just don't have access, then find a way to get that access so we can get them fully vaccinated as well. Uh, same thing around children. Um, we have that same question all the time. You know, I can't wait to be able to hug my grandchildren now that I am fully vaccinated. And yes, we feel that that is perfectly safe for you to do as long as no one is symptomatic and no one is extreme is at high risk for disease. And so when we're talking about children, that's typically children who have uh, who already have lung disease um, or been treating for something severe like cancer or something like that. In which case, you should be protected be protective regardless of the pandemic. And Dr. Jarvis, how's the supply of the vaccine look, look for the state of Maine without uh, Johnson & Johnson coming? Yeah, so the supply is definitely less than we had hoped for, but the, the demand no longer exceeds our supply. So right now across, and I, I spoke to several uh, uh, physician leaders of our, our large healthcare systems across the entire state today, and uh, um, we have vaccine uh, appointments available. So right now we have enough vaccine for what the demand is. I wish it was still that the demand exceeded the the, uh, the actual supply because, like I said, we're only about at that 50% mark of first dose, 33% uh, of people who have received their second dose. That's a long cry from 80 to 90% of all adults being vaccinated in the state of Maine. Um, and so uh, I, I wish it had been the opposite. But for the good news is for those of you who want to get vaccinated, there is vaccine out there. Um, and it, and, it, and it, it's really across all of our health systems. And I also spoke to a retail pharmacist today who said they are seeing the same thing in the retail pharmacies. Great. Thank you. Melissa, I'm going to um, give you the next question. You had talked about in your presentation um, the that you did listening sessions at Mercy Hospital. Um, I, could you tell us a little bit more about how that was organized and coordinated and what were some of the key takeaways that you, that you learned from that that really influenced how you proceeded with your community engagement? Absolutely. So we, um, Charlie Therry and the president at, at Mercy um, uh, invited uh, both staff uh, to attend uh, listening sessions. They were uh, scheduled because we're 24 seven operation, they were scheduled at different times during the day. Um, and, uh, you know, each session uh, had uh, employees attend, um, you know, 
key takeaways truly are trying to really create a safe space, uh, you know, for people to have a, a conversation, you know, as was discussed, uh, there is concern about um, saying the wrong thing, offending somebody or making a misstep. Um, so lots of conversation occurred during the listening sessions around that. Uh, we also heard from uh, our employees uh, from the BIPOC community uh, that many of them did not uh, foresee opportunity uh, for advancement uh, within uh, our organization. Um, so from that uh, truly has come uh, an outgrowth has been a, a new approach to workforce development and career advancement really through that, that lens of equity. Um, so I would say, you know, an outgrowth or how that influence was truly, uh, you know, it, it got me uh, more reflective as it relates to equity and what that frankly means. Um, you know, if you are, um, you know, if you, English is not your first, uh, your native language and you will have other limitations from a, you know, family responsibility or financial uh, concerns, the ability to really take on additional education uh, is uh, an out of reach. It, make, it makes truly uh, that advancement out of reach. So we have completely turned that on its head at Mercy uh, to ensure that people have ability uh, to have targeted advancement, uh, individualized approach uh, as they um, seek advancement at Mercy. Similarly with vaccines, it was really that same approach. Uh, it was that notion that, you know, what needs to be at play, what type of path do we co-create so that uh, everybody gets what they need. Um, and I'm now uh, engaged in some early work around the same approach for women's health. It's, it's truly trying to understand what's it going to take and how do we as an organization have to adapt to ensure that people get all that they need to flourish. Thank you so much, Melissa. <clears throat> um, Marwa, I'm going to ask you the next question, and it's actually from um, the chat box if you wanted to refer to it. But, um, you know, I think that when we talk about diversity at organizations, it is more a focus, tends to be more focused on um, sex, gender identity, race, but um, there is age that is, is, is often, um, it's there, but it's not talked about. And um, would you like to respond to that? Because um, I think that it is an important discussion that employers need to have. Um, I totally agree, Karen, and thank you for this great question. Oftentimes when we talk about diversity, people think we, or they, people focus on uh, race or uh, religion most often, but it truly encompasses all different social identities, including age. That's actually a big one that I receive. I get a lot of complaints about that, that either, you know, I was um, discriminated against because I'm too young, you know, you're just a young pop you know, basically taking away from someone's uh, background and experience and value or the, or, you know, the contrary too. you're, when are you retiring, for example, things that are offensive said to a lot of people. And this is, you know, um, ageism is big within diversity. So um, I always uh, implore you know, employees and employers and leaders alike to really um, go through the different social identities and not focus on just race or religion, you know, um, age and sexual orientation, um, gender, obviously, and also ability, you know, that's, that's huge too within diversity work. There's a lot of uh, ability or ableness. We need to focus on that as well. And even um, characteristics, you know, someone's weight, for example, these are all social identities that, you know, affect how someone is treated. And also, you know, microaggressions are perpetrated with each of these social identities. So when I present to any group about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I make sure that I that this is all encompassing, that we are inclusive of all different social identities and not just gender or race or religion. Um, so I hope that answers that question. It does. Thank you so much. And as a as a follow up, you know, you also referenced unconscious bias and. How does an employer help their employees or what are some strategies they can use to help employees um, 
maybe do some reflection and, and, and see where their bias may be and also reflect on themselves as leaders. Absolutely. You know, and that's the very first training module that I started with because it's huge. This is very, very important. Um, and sometimes, oftentimes, actually, it's hard to rec recognize biases if you're unaware of them to begin with. And, you know, they, they occur at a level well below our level of awareness. So a lot of people don't know what their biases are. And some people have said to me, I don't have any. And I have to remind them that we're human. We all have them. And I know because I've done this work, I know, I know what my biases are, but you really have to educate yourself and regular participation in diversity and inclusion training, for example, where I identifying your unconscious biases is a part of the training should be a part of any training curriculum. And that's one way to, for us to um, acknowledge and recognize our biases. Um, there are numerous I. A T test, like the Harvard Implicit Bias Test, that help you gauge um, and measure your own biases that you're willing to share. Um, so there are so many different ways that you can truly educate yourself, kind of, you know, peel away those layers and figure out what your biases are. Again, we all have them. And that doesn't make us bad people. Typically, we have them despite despite our, our values or despite our wonderful moral compasses. And I truly believe that 99.999% uh, of us uh, have, are, are good people. There is no malice in our hearts, but these biases are due to upbringing and cultural conditioning. And, you know, several things kind of play a role in this um, and the culture that we are raised in and so forth. So it's okay to have them. What's not okay is that we don't acknowledge them and, and, and reflect. And, and like Yamaya said, be quick to apologize when we have committed a microaggression due to the unconscious bias and be able to say, I didn't mean to, I am so sorry, I, I will do better. Uh, you know. And once we know better, we do better. So I think that's uh, important. And um, in the workplace for unconscious bias, it looks like a lot of things. And again, usually coming from like positive intent and positive intent does not negate the, ne the negative impact that has on people. But, you know, um, you know, like continually going to the same go to person, overlooking the potential on all of our employees praising the same people over and over and not making making sure that we praise all of our employees or connecting with some employees and and uh, elevating them and hosting a social and inviting just a few people and not all these are all you know unconscious biases they're due to something but you know there's a root of these behaviors and oftentimes it's either racism or sexism or you know there's something there so once we um, uncover what that bias is then we are able to interrupt the bias and that's essential thank you so much marwa i really i i value and appreciate your passion and i i think that that passion is reflected in the the shift that we're i'm experiencing and seeing as a northern light health employee i think your work has really been powerful and so, Yamaya, I have a question for you as an organization that goes down this path. When are we going to know we're successful? And this is the last question. So, so you're going to um, end it for us. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we could just check a box and get a medal and say we're done? <laughs> um, but that's not how this work is. This work is ongoing. And um, there's a lot to to unpack and shift and our world is continually evolving and changing as are the populations that we interact with. And so um, it's, it's a continual journey and our work is to be, um, to, to embrace that like lifelong learning process and to be willing along the way to check in and listen with under, you know, to underrepresented groups and really see if, you know, the changes are um, having an intended effect and if people are feeling more you know that they're experiencing more equity and more inclusion and that diversity is more uh integrated throughout the system but um that takes uh, a good amount of self-care along the way right there's a real potential for burnout uh, if we go too hot and heavy right out of the gates it can feel exhausting really quickly and there's a real you know potential for people to say oh there's you know I, i'll never be able to do enough fast enough. And so I think that's part of that whole kind of slow your roll is, um, 
is, is em embrace this journey in that kind of long-term perspective that it's going to take time and patience and some self-compassion along the way. Thank you so much, Amaya. Perfect way um, to end today's session. So thank you all for joining us. I hope this hour has been a help to support you and your employees and our communities. Just a reminder, we will be emailing you a survey right after our conference. Please be sure to give us your feedback so we can continue to provide relevant information. Our next session is on May 6th when we will address COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. You will receive a registration link right after today's conference and we hope you will join us. We also encourage you to share the link with friends, colleagues, and any others who may benefit from the information. And by working together, we will keep Maine safe. So thank you so much again and have a wonderful afternoon. Take care.